Last week, what we talked about was oftentimes we go from point A to point B, and we're so busy to get to our destination, we often miss all of the things in between that God has for us. And last week, we looked at a story in Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 39, and it was this story of Jesus living this fully engaged life. He took the opportunities that God gave him on his destination, on his way to the cross, to be present and ready with people. And in this story last week, it says that Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee, or the Lake of Galilee, and the moment he stepped off the boat, who met him? A naked, demon-possessed man. How many of you had any any encounters this week? (laughs) Nathan, put your hand down. (laughs) You, you need to go to that men's retreat, brother. Just saying. But the moment he steps off the boat, he meets this naked, demon-possessed man who's crazy, who's overcome with evil spirits. And we talked about how it's important for us as we live a fully engaged life to be present and, and ready at every moment of the journey. And we see that this demon-possessed man, he postures himself before Jesus. He falls at his feet. And even the demons in him cry out, O Jesus, Son of the Most High God, what have you to do with us? We talked about how the authority of Jesus demands worship and obedience. And Jesus asks this demon-possessed man, he says, what is your name? Because Jesus is after our identity. He desires for us to have no identity apart from Jesus Christ. And in his grace, in his mercy, in his power, Jesus casts out the demons from this man. And we find that this man ends up sitting at the feet of Jesus, fully clothed, in his right mind, asking Jesus what he's supposed to do next. Jesus transforms our life by covering our sin and shame. Jesus transforms our life by covering our sin and shame. And this man desires to follow Jesus, to go with him, but Jesus says, no, I need you to stay here in this land where there are no believers. And I need you to tell the story of what God has done for you. What is the story in your life that God is asking you to tell of what he's done for you? And as we continue on this journey that matters, we're going to look at Luke 8, 40 through 56 today. And it's an incredibly powerful story that continues to look at this theme of living a fully engaged life. Jesus was always present and ready. So if you have your Bibles this morning, go ahead and open to Luke chapter 8, and we're going to begin in verse 40 through 42. So it was, when Jesus returned, and that means he's returning from the other side of the lake, he was in the land of what was called the Gadarenes, Gentile country, he's returning back to Jewish territory. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude or the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him, or they pressed in on him, they almost crushed him. We see at the end of our last story that Jesus is sent away by the people of the Gadarenes, this, this Gentile area. They said, we don't want you here, you've caused too much trouble, you need to leave. And so Jesus leaves that area, and yet when he arrives back in the land of Galilee, He gets an entirely different reception. It says that people are waiting expectantly for him, excited that he's returned. Now, if we look at Jesus' ministry at this point, 
He's done some pretty incredible works that has earned him kind of this rock star status where really anywhere he goes in Jewish territory, people are trying to follow him. He's raised somebody from the dead at this point, the widow's son. He's turned water into wine. He's done some amazing teaching with authority and explaining the Old Testament scriptures. He's healed the sick. He's cast out demons and shown his authority over evil powers. People want to be around Jesus. They're waiting for him expectantly. If you were to ask yourself today, are you waiting expectantly for Jesus and do you want to be around him? How would you respond to that? It's an important question for us to ask ourselves because there's a lot of things that this world has to offer, isn't there? There's a lot of people we can attach ourselves to. There's a lot of activities that we can find ourselves diving into hours or days or years at a time. And yet, do we wait expectantly for Jesus? And are we excited to follow him? So Jesus arrives in Galilee, and it says that there is a large multitude of people. We don't know how many that is. It could have been hundreds. It could have even been thousands of people. That wasn't uncommon. Remember the feeding of the 5,000 or the feeding of the 4,000. There's roughly anywhere from fifteen to 10,000 people who came to listen to Jesus and to be with him. And we know that by this time in his ministry, there's no doubt that the reason this crowd is formed is they want to see a miracle. How many of you would like to see miracles happen in your life? Raise your hand. Yeah, of course, all of us would. And when people hear about this Jesus, the amazing signs and wonders and authority and power that he is teaching with and acting in, they want to see something happen. There may have even been people there that thought he was a prophet, maybe the prophet Elijah who had come back. And it's even possible that there were people in that crowd who were wondering, could this be the promised Messiah? And out of this crowd comes a man named Jairus. And Jairus has a special role in this Jewish community in Galilee. It says that he is the leader of the synagogue. And if you don't know what a synagogue is, just think of the mission church here, or churches like North Coast Calvary or Daybreak. There, are, there is building space where God's people gather together to fellowship and worship God. That's what a synagogue was. In the New Testament period, it was a place in the community where people would go to worship God together as God's people. And it says that the leader of that synagogue comes to Jesus, and then look at what the scripture says. It says, Behold, there came a man named Jairus, he was the ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. Now this is interesting. This is a Jewish leader in the community who would have had relationships with the priests, with the Pharisees, with the Sadducees, and with the citizens of this region of Galilee. And it's as if he cares not for his reputation. He comes desperate and he lays himself and postures himself at the feet of Jesus out of respect and in humility because he's desperate for something. What is our posture before our Savior and King? I can remember, uh, anybody remember those shirts that were made a while ago that said, Jesus is my homeboy? Anybody wear those shirts? (laughs) I don't think that's theologically accurate. Jesus is my homeboy. Jesus is our King and Lord and Savior. And even Jairus, who isn't coming to worship him as the Messiah, has the humility and understanding to posture himself at the feet of Jesus. Jesus isn't just some bro we hang out with. Jesus is our King who demands obedience and worship. And Jairus comes and postures himself in this humble way, and begs him, Jesus, come to my house. 
And I think sometimes we read the scripture, we talked about this a little bit last week, we read the scriptures and it's kind of nice and neat, it's just a narrative, it tells us matter-of-factly what happened, but we don't get a lot of the emotion sometimes. And I can imagine that a man who is desperate for something comes running from who knows where and how far away, he could be sweating, his clothes could be ripped from running, but he falls down at the feet of Jesus and he's just trying to get, I just... I need, you, I need you to come to my house. I need you. And this is why he needed Jesus. Verse 42. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands on this. But whether it was a family member or a close friend... How many of you would run to find help as quickly as possible if you knew somebody was dying? You see, we see the physical needs that Jairus has for his daughter, and yet there is also a spiritual lesson for us to learn in this. There is a sense of urgency in which people are perishing, and how often are we running to the feet of Jesus saying, Jesus, they're going to die. I need you to do a work in their life. I can't do it. The doctors can't do it. The spiritual condition of people's souls is that they are perishing. Are we willing to run to the feet of Jesus and to ask for his help? Who is that person or who are those people in your life? Are you interceding for them on their behalf? No matter what they've done to you, no matter who they are or where they come from or how bad they might seem or be, is that what we're doing as servants of the Most High God? We see that Jairus, he's overwhelmed. He's overcome with sorrow. He's afraid his daughter is going to die. Jairus needs a miracle. And he's turned to Jesus for help because there's nowhere else to go. If you're taking notes this morning, write this down. Compassion in crisis is the response of Christ. Compassion in crisis is the response of Christ. Matthew chapter 9 verse 36 talks about Jesus witnessing these crowds. Why don't we read this together? But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were wearied and scattered. The response of Jesus to people in crisis, not only in his public ministry, which we see lived out in the Gospels, but I believe also here and now, his response is compassion. And I think oftentimes, as human beings... We don't know what to do when a person is in crisis. Again, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but if someone's ever come to you and they're freaking out or they've got this massive mountain of a problem and they come to you for help, sometimes we kind of freeze. We don't know what to do or what to say. Or we flight. We just run away from the whole situation because we know we can't fix anything. And what the Word is teaching us to do is to give compassion To those who are in crisis. Whether you think it's a crisis or not. Doesn't matter. If that person perceives that they are in the middle of a crisis. The first thing we should do. Is give them compassion. Empathy. Do your best to relate to them. To listen to them. And we see that Jesus does this. Because at the end of verse 42. It says, but as he went, meaning Jesus, the multitudes thronged him. Jesus was willing to go with Jairus to his house. Now there's something interesting about what Luke specifically in his gospel mentions about this 12-year-old daughter of Jairus. First, uh, 12-year-old kids in Jewish society, when they turned 13, they were considered adults Girls specifically were becoming of marrying age. And so she was ready to make this transition into where the rest of her life was about to begin. And yet she's on her deathbed instead. And Jairus is desperate. 
But Luke gives us another detail. He says that it's his only... I always get emotional. (laughs) It's his only daughter. I have one daughter. I can't imagine what Jairus must have felt like. So desperate. So needing a miracle. So needing Jesus. And it says that she was his only daughter. And I love this part because it's so intentional by the gospel writers to mention this. Because God has an only son and his name is? His name is Jesus. And if anyone understands what it's like to lose their only child, it's the father. Because he had to watch his only son whom he sent to earth. To become sin for us and endure the wrath that we deserved. And his son was killed and crucified on a cross and then buried. God understands the pain. He understands the sorrow. He relates to his people and the trials and tribulations that we walk through. If anyone understood Jairus, it was God. And so Jesus has compassion. He responds with compassion. And he's willing to walk with Jairus to his home. The end of verse 42, it says, He went with Jairus, but the crowds thronged him, pressed in on him, almost crushed him. How many of you in this part, you can raise your hands. How many of you feel like, I know, JC, I know where I'm supposed to go. That can be today, that can be in eternity. I know the destination I'm supposed to get to, but sometimes life gets so crazy busy, I don't know if I'm going to make it. Anybody relate? There's a sense of urgency here, right? Jairus' daughter is dying. Jesus needs to get there quickly. And yet the crowds, the busyness, is not letting him move at a rapid pace to get to Jairus' house. Verses 43 through 48. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood or all her money on physicians, could not be healed by any. She came from behind and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, "Uh, Master, the multitudes throng and press you. And you say, who touched me? But Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was immediately healed. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Now what I love about this in relationship to when we're talking about the journey matters and living a life fully engaged is sometimes we get assignments. Sometimes we know, okay, I've got my schedule here. I've got this meeting here. I've got to pick up the kids here. I've got to get to this place by five o'clock. And then what happens to all of your plans? Everyone knows. That's good, right? They, They don't work out the way that you think they will. There's a wrench thrown in or somebody else needs something or the car goes down or you forgot something in the house and you got to go back and now you're late. And all of this busyness begins to crowd the opportunity to get to your destination when you want to get there. And there's a temptation for us to see those things as unwanted hindrances and negative experiences in our life. But I believe what the gospel show us in Jesus is that these are actually opportunities for us to watch God work in the mundane ways that our life journeys for the purpose of his glory and growing in our faith. Think of Jairus with Jesus side by side. And you can imagine Jairus is maybe like half a step ahead of Jesus. Like, okay, come on. And all of a sudden Jesus stops and he's like, hey, someone touched me. 
What do you think Jairus is thinking? Listen, I'm trying to be respectful and all, but my daughter's dying. Is the situation real? Is it urgent? It absolutely is. And yet Jesus isn't afraid to stop and engage for the purpose of living a life that matters. This woman, we get a little bit of background of her, says that for 12 years straight, she hadn't stopped bleeding. We don't get the details of what her condition is. Uh, There's probably a few things that we can imagine what it is for her. But when we go back to Jewish culture and what that meant for her, there's an entire section of Leviticus chapter 15. It's in a section of the Bible called the Pentateuch or the Law. It's the first five books of the Bible. And it provides instruction to the Jewish nation, God's people, Israel. It provides them instruction of how they are to remain clean in God's eyes. And if there's anything unclean about them, they have to go through a ritualistic process in order to be made clean so that they can worship God and be engaged in community. And one of the things in Leviticus 15, 19 through 30, it's quite a handful of verses, It talks about if someone is bleeding, they are then unclean. And anything that they touch makes somebody else unclean too. So you can imagine this woman for 12 years has been considered by her community unclean. And that's not just from the religious standpoint. That's also from social isolation. You imagine this woman's plight, how this affected her relationships how people viewed her. As a matter of fact, Luke even identifies her as the woman who had blood flow for 12 years. She doesn't even get a name. She's identified by her her disease or her ailment. She's desperate. She's needing Jesus. What is it in your life that makes you unclean or afraid, or desperate. What is that thing? My encouragement to you is come to Jesus. Bring it to Him. This story is very interesting. Um, How many of you remember the centurion soldier? Right? He's a Roman soldier who comes to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, my servant is ill and dying. Just say the word and he'll be healed. And Jesus kind of goes, wow, such faith I've not seen in all of Israel. And the centurion's response is, I'm a man under authority. When I tell my men to go here, I trust that they do it. All you have to do is say the word and my servant will be healed. That's like all-star faith, right? Now I want you to think about Jairus. Does Jairus have all-star faith? No, he doesn't. If we're looking at this from uh, the pulpit or from the modern day church, we get to analyze everybody's stuff. He doesn't have all-star faith. He kind of has weak, desperate, I got nowhere else to go faith. Like maybe you can do something. I hope you can do something, but I need you to come to my house. But then look at this woman. Does she have all-star faith? Kind of, but it's weird. And here's why it's weird. Is Jesus' primary purpose of why he came to earth to work miracles among people? No, right? We know that he's headed to the cross to die for the sins of many and to bring new life that we could never achieve on our own. And yet this woman kind of has this like superstitious, okay, all I got to do is just touch his clothes and I'll be healed. Now that definitely requires faith, but it's a little bit weird because that's not really how Jesus works. He's not some relic that you get power from. And yet there's something completely amazing in the grace of Jesus to both Jairus and this woman in the story. Why does Jesus ask the question, who touched me? He's in a hurry. He could have just been like, oh cool, someone just got healed and kept going to Jairus' house, right? 
But he could have. There's a sense of urgency to get moving to Jairus' house. And yet he stops. And here's why I believe he stops. Jesus is never too busy to love and to listen. Jesus is never too busy to love and to listen. And we need to hear this. Not just because we need to put this into practice, but we need to be reminded that this is who God is to us. And that no matter how small or how desperate we are, we need to remember that we have a Savior who's never too busy for us. He loves you and He wants to listen to you at any time of day or night. And when you feel like you have nowhere else to go, When you feel like you've lost your support. The world offers things to run to. And my encouragement would be to run to Jesus. Who's never too busy to love and to listen. Uh, As a parent, I fall short in this all the time. It never fails. I'm trying to get out the door to go to work. I'm trying to get out the door to go to church service on Sunday morning. And the kid's like, Daddy, I want a hug. Okay. Okay. And then the kid, I got names for my kids, but you don't know them, so I'm just, yeah. The other kid, kid number two, comes around the corner and is like, Daddy, I want a hug. Oh, okay. I'm like halfway to my truck. Daddy! Oh my gosh, I gotta go. I'm thankful that Jesus isn't like that. As a matter of fact, think about this. We have a mentality that time prohibits us from being more intentional with people in our life for the purpose of exemplifying Jesus Christ. We feel like we are bound by time. I only have so much time to do so many things. Therefore, I can't really give you all the time that you need. That's a lie. Who made time? God did. In his absolute sovereignty, can God provide you whatever it is so that you can be obedient to him in the way that you treat others? I, my assumption is yes. But let's look at the practical side of that. What happens sometimes when we stop to take time out of our day that we normally didn't plan to? Is it possible you might be late to something? Yes. Is it possible that because you're late to a certain something, you might get in trouble? Yes. Worst case scenario, could you lose your job? Yeah. Could you start a fight with your spouse? Definitely. There's all these things that we could think of that could go wrong, of the reasons that we can't. But what if the enemy is selling us that lie for the purpose of us not fully engaging with others and loving and listening to them like Jesus does for us? What if the enemy doesn't have to destroy your entire life, but just throw some seeds of doubt as, oh, listen, you don't have time for your kid right now. you got to go to this thing. Oh, you don't have time to pray with your wife. you got to get some sleep. you got to get to that meeting. You don't have time to read the scriptures. I mean, who has an hour to do that? Who has half an hour? Who has five minutes? It's not very productive. Little lies that keep us from living a life that is fully engaged in Christ. This woman realizes Jesus isn't going to let this thing go. Who touched me? Someone touched me. I know you touched me. I felt power go out of me. And look at the posture that she comes with. Verse 47. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling. She's afraid. And falling down before him, she declared to him, this is awesome, in the presence of all the people, the reason she had touched him, Jesus, I touched you because I've been bleeding for 12 years, and I've spent my life savings, and doctors can't help me, and I've been healed. In front of everybody. A confession that Jesus has radically changed her life.
Jesus' response is so powerful to this woman. We know, sitting from where we are, is the woman in trouble? She is, with her bleeding, with her life condition. But with Jesus, is she in trouble? No, she's not. But she doesn't know that. She's afraid. This powerful teacher's turned around and been like, who touched me? Listen to Jesus' response. The first thing, try not to cry again. First thing he says to her is, daughter. Her identity changed like that. She went from the woman who had been bleeding from 12 years to daughter of Jesus. That's amazing. That's amazing. He says, daughter. I wonder if a woman like that had been spoken to that way in 12 years. And knowing Jesus, probably the way that he said it just melted her entire soul. He calls her daughter, and then he sees that she's afraid, she's trembling, she's postured herself humbly before him, and he says, Be of good cheer, rejoice, don't be afraid. It's okay. He takes away her fear. And then he says, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Now I love this about Jesus. And this is where I think we can learn something really important for our lives. Especially if you are a believer walking with Jesus. This is important. Oftentimes... Whether it's because we've been studying theology, which is good to study, or whether because we've been walking with the Lord for a long time, I think we get the wrong perception that in order for someone to come into saving faith, it has to be packaged nicely. They have to understand really what goes on in the gospel. They need to get it in terms of, hey, we are not saved by works. We are saved by faith alone and grace alone and Christ alone. And although all those things are true, I think we think it's supposed to look like this nice, neat package where someone can explain what's happening to them. Anybody relate to that? And yet look at the mess that this is. This woman was so convinced that all she had to do was touch this guy's clothes, she could be made well. She's got kind of this weird superstitious faith thing going on. And yet Jesus just meets her right where she is. Just like he met Jairus right where he was. Could you imagine if Jairus came to Jesus and Jesus is like, you know, I met this centurion one time. (laughs) Jairus would have felt terrible. But he doesn't do that. He's like, yeah, I'll walk with you to your house or to this woman. He goes, oh, your faith has made you well. If you're taking notes this morning, write this down. Meet people where they are and fan their ember of faith into flame. I don't care if they have a weirdo idea of faith. If they've come to Jesus and are putting some element of faith into him, fan it. Find a way to encourage them. Find a way to bless them. Find a way to share with them. In such a way that they continue to move forward towards Jesus. It doesn't need to be nicely packaged. They don't have to be able to explain deep theology of what's happening to them. They've already come to Jesus and postured themselves at his feet. That's a really good start. And I think as believers, I'm reminded sometimes I need to go back there. Because I'm not always there. Hebrews 11, I encourage you to read it on your own time this week. It talks about what is faith. But faith is the substance. It's what you can hold on to of the things hoped for. Of what is to come. Of the promises of God. The evidence of things not seen. Our faith, how we live out the life of Christ, is the evidence of what we cannot see. God himself. The future hope and glory that Romans chapter 1 talks about. Wow. Could you imagine if Jesus didn't stop? All of that could have just flown by. But he stopped. He's not too busy. Now let me ask you something. Who's watching all this happen? 
Okay, the crowd is watching all this happen. They just watched a woman be healed. Who else is watching this? Jairus is watching this. Now, imagine Jairus. Jesus enters into this full-blown conversation. Maybe like Jairus isn't even there and Jesus has somehow got ADD and totally forgot that he's supposed to be going to somebody's house to heal them so they don't die. And Jairus is probably sitting there like, okay, I, like, it's great, you're not bleeding anymore, but Jesus, like, we got to go. We could say that this may have seemed like a negative Or untimely interruption for Jairus. And yet it most certainly won't go to waste. What are the interruptions that we face during our week. That we can trust will not go to waste. If we're living a fully engaged life in Christ. Verse 49. Through the rest of the chapter. While he was still speaking. Someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Don't trouble the teacher any longer. Let's just stop there for a second. Worst case scenario has happened. Jesus took the time to stop on his way to a destination that he had. For the purpose of engaging with another who was hurting. He gave her compassion. He listened and loved her. And the worst thing that could happen. Was that Jairus' daughter died. Because Jesus didn't get there in time. We live with the pressure in our life. That if we don't do enough. Things are going to die. Constantly. If I only would have put in that extra hour of work, maybe I would have got that promotion. If I only would have spent more time with my kids here, here, and here, maybe they wouldn't be going through what they're going through now. Maybe if I had gotten a higher education, my family wouldn't be struggling financially and we could live somewhere else. Scenario after scenario after scenario, we can beat ourselves up really bad. Who owns time? Where does hope and healing come from? God, it's not in our efforts. It's not in what we could have done, should have done, want to do. Hope and healing are found in Christ. Not ourselves. Not in what we do. I love how compassionate Jesus is. Imagine standing with a man who's patiently waiting for his daughter to hopefully be healed by Jesus. And this messenger comes and says, your daughter's dead. Don't trouble the teacher any longer. Listen to Jesus' response. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, the man who gave the message. He said, don't be afraid. Only believe, and she will be made well. Now, the thing that is so powerful about this is, one, Jesus is showing compassion. He knows, oh my goodness, Jairus must be feeling terrible. What horrible news for this man to lose his child. And so he says, don't be afraid. Only believe. Now, that could be just words, but when we consider what has just happened, what did Jairus just witness? He just witnessed an incredible miracle. Do you think that that had an impact on what Jesus just told him of just believe and she'll be made well? You bet it did. That untimely interruption, that seemingly unplanned distraction is actually increasing Jairus' faith. It's helping him to grow in a way that he never could if he wasn't facing trial and testing. And Jesus is still right there with him. Don't be afraid. Only believe and she will be made well. You saw this woman who had faith. You saw her get healed. I'm going to do the same for your daughter. When he came into the house, Jesus permitted no one to go in except Peter 
and James and John and the father and mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her. But Jesus said, do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. Jesus finally gets to Jairus' house. And in Jewish culture, they had to bury the body within a certain amount of time. And so the funeral process started immediately after death. And being the leader of the local synagogue, it is not unlikely that there were many people there to support Jairus and his family. And one of the things in Jewish culture that's very important is mourning with those who mourn. And they would actually have people who were professional mourners. People who would come and wail and weep on behalf of the family to show respect and to enter into the suffering. And so the house is covered with people in this lament because this girl has died and Jesus comes in and says, hey, hey, she's just sleeping. And it says they ridiculed Jesus because they knew she was dead. Luke is making it a point for us to understand this little girl's not in a coma. She's not in some deep sleep. She's dead. And everybody knows it. Verse 54. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand, and called her, saying, Little girl, arise. <laughs> oh. How many of you guys like happy endings to stories? Yeah, this is one of them. As a matter of fact, the Bible's full of them. They're not the story ending that we might paint for ourselves, but it's always happy endings. It's amazing. Jesus says, with Peter, James, and John in the room, and the girl's mother and father in the room, he says, little girl, rise. And then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately, and he commanded that she be given something to eat. This is amazing to me. When we think and consider the sorrow of her parents, specifically her father, he ran to get to Jesus. He loves his little girl. She's dead. Jesus tells this little girl to get up, and she does. It says her spirit returned. It was gone. Jesus called her back from the dead and gave her life. Obviously, there's a spiritual connection here too. People who are dead through the power of Jesus Christ can be given new life. But here's what I love about this story. Is Jesus has used this journey for Jairus of witnessing this woman being healed, of experiencing the sorrow and pain of losing her da- his daughter and then bringing her back to life. This is what I think about is so powerful. Jesus was fully God and fully man. And I don't know how all that works. I just know he feels what we feel. And although he has no sin, he experiences what we experience. This was a man who was one day, very soon, going to go to a cross. And he was going to be put through anguish and pain and rejected and mocked. And yet he was the savior of the world. And I think in this story, he gets to see a little tiny picture of why he's going to the cross. He gets to watch a little girl get up from the dead. And go back to her father's arms. And he's rejoicing. You're alive. You're alive. I can't believe it. Jesus, thank you. You're alive. And when Christ went to the cross, do you know how many people were raised up from the dead and brought back and reconciled to their heavenly father? And he rejoices saying, you're alive. You're alive. Just a small taste. I believe even Jesus needed encouragement. And the power of God working through him shown him in just a small piece Of what was to come from a terrible trial that he would go through. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. 
John 11.25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. What a story. But it's not just a story to stir us emotionally. It's not just a story to give us some far off hope. It's a story of what actually happened to us who've come to Christ and been reconciled to our Father. We've been brought back from the dead. We've been raised up to new life. Next week we're going to finish our last week in this series. And I love the next story because the previous two weeks, the demon-possessed man and Jesus' authority over demons and restoring this man, the woman who is healed from her bleeding because of her faith and Jairus' daughter who was raised up from the dead, it all ties together of Jesus has a purpose for these things. It's for us to be sent out with the same power, the same hope, the same love that Christ had for others for the purpose of glorifying the name of Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, you have sent your son, Jesus Christ, because he is the resurrection and the life. God, there is no one like you. There is no one else who on this journey could pause the way that you did and listen and love others and show them compassion and not be worried about the constraints of time or what might happen, but to fully engage for the purpose of healing, of new life being raised from the dead. Lord, we know that you love us that much. And not only do you love us that much that that's what you did for us, but that you call us to live like Christ and to do the same in the relationships that you've put us in within our context of our family, our neighborhoods, our places of work. Just even when we're out on the street walking around. Lord, this journey matters. And you've called us to a fully engaged life in Christ. Let our hearts be subject to you. Let our minds think on these things and on your word so that we may glorify the name of Jesus. It's in your name we pray.